Here's a song that will get your heart rate up. Every time I sing the word up, reach for the stars. Every time I sing the word down, touch the ground. The rest of the time, march with your knees high. Those magnificent men in their flying machines, they go up to the up, up, they go down, down, down. Welcome to the Powell River Airport in Powell River, British Columbia, Canada. Home to a eclectic mix of certified aircraft, experimental aircraft, the home of the Westview Flying Club, and the shelter for an eclectic mix of motorized, non-motorized vehicles, including planes. Glory be, some planes such as my Sea Ray seaplane amphibian that I've been building for the past six and a half years. First up in the little town of Mackenzie in central British Columbia, and now down here on the coast of the Salish Sea in Powell River. I'm about 93% now, I figure. Still planning to get airborne in the next month or so. So please follow along with my videos my challenges, my struggles, as I get my Spirit of the Mackenzie completed and into the air. Well, perhaps you've been wondering why I'm naming my uh, seaplane amphibian, the Spirit of Mackenzie. Well, one reason is my bagpipe tartan. Came with the pipes. They're actually third hand. The original owner was a cadet in the Canadian Army Regiment, the Seaforth Highlanders. And their tartan was the Mackenzie tartan. Another reason was I started building the kit when I was living in the small central BC town of Mackenzie, B.C. So hats off to Mackenzie, B.C. And Mackenzie, B.C. is named after the intrepid Scottish-Canadian explorer, first white man to boldly go where no white man had gone before, trotting over the poor indigenous people's land all the way from the east coast of Canada to the west coast. And... Uh, in his honor, the massive Mackenzie River system has been named after him. All good reasons to name my seaplane the Spirit of Mackenzie. Adventure, excitement, resilience, heritage. But uh, no, I don't plan to. Uh, paint the plane all over with the Mackenzie Tartan, though there might be a splash somewhere. So today I'm installing the brake hose, the 1 8 inch plastic hose that runs up from the fitting on the disc brake of each main gear wheel. This is the pilot side. And you can see the hose goes up and through a grommet, through a fiberglass hull. And then from the two sides, co-pilot and pilot side. The hoses run into the middle, down below the lower bulkhead, into a T-fitting, and from there the hose runs up this central tube, up to the outlet side of the parking brake switch valve. And then from the outlet side, I'm just gonna install the hose now, that'll run back, to one of these fittings on the brake master cylinder from the other side. The hose will run back and up to the brake reservoir, which right currently is just lying on the luggage rack, but would be normally installed right here. So this is going surprisingly well today with this little plastic hose and all these little brass fittings. 
the little ferrules in them. Each one seems to have a different type of ferrule. I have to kind of scratch my head and figure it out. But a little applied engineering and common sense and trial and error has got me pretty good progress so far today. The next step will then be to pump some brake fluid up from the bottom of each disc brake. There's a fitting underneath, underneath there. And somehow I gotta pump it up through the tubing and pushing all the bubbles out. And that I've heard from various sources, including the online forum for sea ray owners is quite a challenge, but one step at a time. So Sammy, how was that hike today? Wow, we just finished six kilometer hike along the Sunshine Coast Trail. This time on the east side of Powell Lake. We ended up here in beautiful little Haywire Bay. Lovely camping, picnicking, swimming spot. Over there is Scout Mountain, which we crossed in the last episode and came down into the outlet of the lake at the marina at lunch. Also in the last video, we hiked up onto that little knob, knob Valentine Mountain. Pretentious name for a little hill. And there's where we started today, that dip in the horizon. That's Mowat Bay, an often calm, smooth water bay. And we hiked all along the lake there today, about three hours. Can't wait to get the Spirit of the Mackenzie up in the air and down on this water. So today I'm going to install the uh, brake fluid into the brake system. I believe the uh, official spec for the brake oil I'm supposed to use is a military spec. Mill H5606, which is very common at least in the light uh, aviation field. But uh, my hangar mates here who have experimental planes and some certified planes recommend this Mobile Univis HVI-13, which is similar to that mill spec with an ISO viscosity of about 13. Um, but they recommend this over the mill spec oils because of the... Uh, salty air we have here in this coastal town and the very uh, rapid uh, gumming up or corrosion you can get in your brake system so by trial and error they've determined that this mobile uh, hvi 13 is what i should use and a hangar mate has very nicely provided me uh, some oil and uh, this old plunger can to help force it into the system and then this hose which will go on the end of the plunger spout and with this fitting that can go on the brass fitting which is on the bottom of the disc brake housing down there so let's see if I can fit all this together well I'm not off to a good start here my friend's adapter uh, doesn't fit on the little uh, tit, so to speak, at the bottom of the bleed valve. That little tit or protrusion is supposed to fit in that slot. And that allows you to get a good grip onto the bleed valve. So what I'm going to do is just take that off. I'll put the hose over the bleed valve and hope it, hope it holds. Let's give it a try. This is my setup. I got an old fashioned uh, Oilers can there with a little bit of hose that goes onto the bypass valve underneath the disc brake. I'm pumping my uh, Univis HVI 13 from mobile <laughs> through the tube. And it meets at a T fitting right there, the hose from the pilot side. And then uh, Brake fluid goes all the way up to the bow of the boat to a parking valve, parking brake valve right there. And then returns, if the valve is open and lets it, 
to the slave or master cylinder underneath the brake handle right here. And from there, it goes up to the fluid reservoir, which is mounted right here. And you can see I've just got about half an inch of brake fluid in there now. So I'm just going to finish pumping it up. Like I say, so far so good. But who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 seconds. I put a little piece of white rag there under that receiver tank or jar and also under all the other connections in the tubing so that I don't accidentally uh, spill all over the inside of the hull if something lets go. Okay, so now I'm just trying to pump the system full. Flying around, looping the loop and defying the ground. Up and down, they're frightfully keen. Those magnificent men in their flying machines. They can fly upside down with their feet in the air. They don't think of danger. Hello, Samantha for your listening pleasure. Scotland the Brave. Arr. Beauty to the ears, huh? Well, carrying on with reacquiring lost skills, I've been practicing on my bagpipe practice chanter, a few tunes, and uh, I've also ordered in some parts to rebuild my bagpipes, which haven't been played in many years. The bagpipes consist of a bass drone, two tenor drones, a blowpipe, a bag, and the chanter, where the tunes are played by blowing the air from the bag through a reed. A reed, did I say a reed? And then fingering the tune. So, I've ordered some new reeds for the chanter, and in each of the Drones, there is a tubular reed, yeah, got a nice matched set of modern plastic ones uh, that I'll install in the drones. When I was learning to play these, after many years after, the only drone reeds available were made of bamboo, but nowadays they have, uh, these ones made of plastic, which I'm sure have some benefits. Okay, so that's uh, something I'll be working on over the next uh, week or two, getting the bagpipes rebuilt. Here, Sammy, you play. Your turn, okay? No, hey, come on, Sammy. They're not that awful. Well, maybe they are now. Bob, that's disgraceful the way you're treating your bagpipes, but wonderful the way you're treating your dog. Yeah. Well, okay. I got the brake fluid into the brake system. I uh, got all the bubbles out and it seems to check out. I spun the wheels a little bit by hand with the plane up in the air and sure enough the brakes grabbed. So, good enough for now. Brake system, 99%. Uh, so I'm another step towards this milestone I've been planning for some time, which is the engine start. First time engine start. But I needed to get some of these systems done first to allow me to start the engine safely. That included brakes, so the plane doesn't run away on me. 
in addition to tying it down, I, I want to have those brakes. Uh, I also got enough of the electrical system installed uh, to allow the engine to start and to run some of the instrumentation to allow me to know what the engine is doing when it's running. I got the landing gear uh, actuators operating so I know I won't accidentally uh, have the plane collapse on its landing gear or something else silly happen while I'm running the engine. So yeah, that, now the next uh, system to get the 99% if not 100% before I can start the engine is the fuel system. So let's have a look at what's involved there. Now the plane's Rotax 912 ULS 100 horsepower engine uh, runs on either 100 LL uh, gasoline but preferably on just a high octane uh, motor gas without ethanol. You put it in through that filling to spout there just like on a automobile. That goes into that plastic uh, 24 US gallon tank underneath the baggage compartment. It runs out to a gas escalator down here up through a fuel filter. Right in here, there's an electric fuel pump underneath. And then it goes up a hose through the pylon. Connects on here at the end of this hose uh, to a hose, which I'll show you momentarily, which will go span the gap to the mechanical fuel pump, which is on the engine. And on the other side of that is a hose here running to the two carburetors. And you can see this section of hose is encased in a red fire sleeve. As this area of the engine is pretty hot, and the fuel is obviously very combustible and dangerous and flammable, uh, I followed the good suggestions of putting this fire sleeve material on. The fuel hoses, which are in closest proximity to the engine. Then on the other side of the fuel pump is a small uh, return fuel hose that runs under the engine back down the pylon and back into the fuel tank. So here's the missing section of hose and it's missing because when I put my down my tools a few years ago uh, I stopped building the plane for a while while I was overseas I hadn't yet got to putting the fire sleeve on and in the time I forgot how to put it on. It's not easy because this fire sleeve is a tight fit. Yeah, there's a lot of friction in here too. Um, so I had to figure out again how I did that by referring back to my online uh, logbook. And uh, then once I figured out how I had done it, I had to get some help. And what you do is you plug the end of this hose, the inner hose, put baby powder on here, and then get another person to help you and blow air through the gap uh, between the hoses and lo and behold it slides on like a slippery eel easy to say but it took me a lot of head scratching checking write-ups and looking for help to get that one back on but now what i got to do is i got to put a band here another band here so that this doesn't move and then i put some uh black silicone heat resistant on the ends to uh, protect the ends and then I need a little uh, hose clamp on here to allow it to clamp onto the end of the uh, spigot which is on the fuel pump just like this one and this brings up another subject tools Every company that tries to convince you to buy a kit plane and build it tells you that you don't need much in the way of specialty tools. Uh, standard workshop tools will suffice. Yeah, well, bullshit. I cry bullshit on that. Let me just show you a sampling of some of the 
special tools. This is just some of them that I've procured over the years. Put away, lost, forgot how to use them, forgot where I put them. Classic example being this little device. Ever seen one of these before? Well, it works with these. And this band goes on there. And this is the tool you use to put it on. It took me an hour today to find that tool. It took me a little less longer to find the best straps. Of course, they weren't together. That would have required some intelligence on my part to have put them away together in the past. Okay, let's get on to fixing up this last hose and installing it. One small step towards the uh, final system that I have to do, which is a fuel system prior to starting the engine. Okay, this should be fun. Now I'm going to try to re-remember, <laughs> relearn how you put these straps on, how you use this uh, fancy tool. Okay, so these are stainless steel straps. Now I believe I fit it in like this and there is a slot in the axle uh -huh. and then I think you maybe press that down like that crank it up I don't know it's got some sort of I'm gonna break that off so you know what that's enough for today I'm gonna to google it and some soon to be loving friend of mine is gonna show me how on Google to use this little tool called the strap binder Gerard and company well I tried catch me on the flip side when I know how to do it Well, I can't believe it. Couldn't find anything on Google. So I'm stumbling along again on my own. Um, but this looks a bit more encouraging, I think. Voila. Now I'll just put some of this caulking on there. I'll do the other end. And then I'll place this on the plane. Well, that wasn't so bad after all. Whew. What an emotional, mental, and physical struggle for such a simple, well not simple, uh, small job. Not simple, small job. Who are you looking at? Aha. Well, and now, as Monty Python would say, it's time for something completely different. So let's consult the Magic 8-Ball and see what's on the agenda. You may rely on it. Yeah, not so helpful. Okay. 
Baseball hats. Topic of the day. Elaine hates this hat. My only defense is it's my flying club hat. Uh, the particular cut of the panels, the style, is what someone in the flying club deemed to be appropriate for flying club members, so I insist on wearing it. Uh, my, to bolster my defense, I've told her that when I was in South Africa a few years ago and learning to fly at uh, Aviation Adventures Flying Club in Hazy View, South Africa, good old Wally. Hey Wally, this is the cap that he had, and he had a reason for this kind of a General Rommel Africa Corps tank commander's hat with the flat panel, somewhat like this. His reasoning being that uh, your earphones, your headset, fit much more comfortably on this sort of hat, which didn't have a button or a peak. So Wally, I'm relying on you in my defense of my Westview Flying Club uh, ugly hat, as Elaine would say. So, as I move through my milestones in building my plane, I'm going to be uh, wearing different hats in celebration. This is the next one. Never worn. See the tag? Never worn. This is uh, the Rotax aircraft engine hat I got when my engine was delivered some years ago. And as I'm moving forward to completing some of the major systems on the plane, heading towards the milestone of starting the engine for the first time, I will be wearing this very beautiful hat. It's got a nice mesh uh, inside liner, nice material, nice feel to it. Ooh, cool button. Bombardier, I think it's a BRP. Anyway, so that is the next hat I'll wear. And then, uh, this one, the Sea Ray hat, when I finally get the plane uh, moving, uh, say for taxi tests, I'll feel I've earned the right to wear the Sea Ray hat. But by then, maybe I'll have to get Elaine to order me a new one, because this one uh, has been hanging around for quite a few years, <laughs> as the kit has, and it's got a bit of a rust stain up there on that little button. That little button that I'm sure Wally in Hazy View, South Africa, would say would be very uncomfortable under a headset. And that is why he would insist I wear this hat. What do you think? Hey, Sammy! You don't like this part of the show? Uh, come on. Don't be so critical. No one likes a critic. There you go. There you go. There you go. Fits really nice, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> so there's the hose coming from under the wing, up over the engine. I'll secure it with twist ties probably here. And it's gonna come back and it's gonna join on to that spigot on the mechanical fuel pump on top of the engine. So everything looks pretty good here, I think. It's not uh, rubbing against anything. Certainly nothing that can burn it. Okay, well there it is. A good job, well done. Well, by amateur build standards. So there's the new hose, fire sleeve coming across the top, secured to these other hoses, running down to the top of the, I was gonna say manual, mechanical. Have I called it manual before? Well, it's the mechanical fuel pump in addition to the electric fuel pump, which is up in the cockpit. So I've secured it here. I've gone over all these fittings, all these little uh, securing ties uh, to make sure that everything's okay. I noticed that there was a missing stainless steel band here, uh, which I've now put on. I've noticed also that there was a missing uh, hose clamp here, which I've now put on. You can see this tube here, which is the return fuel to the fuel tank is uh, still not fire sleeve. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna put that fire sleeve on, but I'm gonna run the engine first. Okay, just gotta cut through some of these smaller tasks um, and get this engine running and then go back and make sure everything's copacetic. 
Okay, so as far as I can tell now, all the fuel system components are in place. So the next step would be to put some fuel in the tank, check for leaks under static pressure, and then turn the fuel pumps on and see what sort of flow I can get. And to do that, I'll probably disconnect here and let the uh, fuel fall into a beaker where it can be measured. Okay, so that uh, will be the fuel system. And then I've just got to uh, put lubricating oil into the sump and put cooling fuel, <laughs> cooling liquid into the uh, uh, radiator system. Put the uh, engine management system into the plane so I have some instrumentation. And then I'm very close to starting the engine. So stay tuned for the next video coming soon to your home theater near you. Well, today we're on Harwood Island out in the Salish Sea west of Powell River. In the background there is Vancouver Island. And to the north of us is Savory Island. This is a beach well known in my family. We used to have family picnics here going back 50 years. Coming over in the family boat, mom and dad in the lead of course. And today we're honoring our father, grandfather, father-in-law with a, this remembrance, celebration of life. And we'll be laying his ashes to rest out on the, on the ocean as we did for mom a few years ago. We've all got wonderful memories of beaches like this on the backside of Harwood, where many of us learned to water ski. We'd go fishing, improbbed, impromptu games of football, both soccer and a Canadian football, half in the water, half out of the water. Wonderful family picnics and memories over here, which is why we've decided to gather today at hopefully the conclusion of the pandemic to lay our father to rest, which we haven't been able to do in more than a year since he passed at the beginning of the pandemic closures. This island is owned by the local indigenous tribe, but as in all areas of the coast in Canada, the beaches between the water and the high tide mark are public. So we're quite free to come here and enjoy the, the beauty. Or would I? This lovely family vacation. Can't wait to bring the spirit of Mackenzie in on this beach. Perhaps not on a day with a brisk of wind, but certainly it's got a great beach for coming up on hard sand and a great place to spend the afternoon.